Right, so we're now live. Welcome everyone to Lightroom 101. And when I swap over to the Lightroom screen, if you just mute your mics for me, etc., etc., and we'll make a start. Okay, so this is going to assume one thing that you've got Lightroom already installed uh, and you're not really used to using Lightroom itself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through each of the little modules that's on the top, just give a, a brief explanation of what they do, and then we'll come back and go to the main two ones that you'll spend most of your time in. So first one that we've got, and this is the one that you go into, is your library. And from here, this is where you actually sort all of your catalog settings. It's where all your main, your main stuff is actually organized. Uh, and it's one of the big parts of Lightroom. Uh, in the develop module, that will load shortly. This is where, this is basically Camera Raw. So along here, you've got all your settings that you would have in Camera Raw, and that's where you do all your editing of the pictures. It's where you do your spot correction and anything like that. Like I said, I'm, I'm going to come back to these in much more detail. This is just a overview of the, the actual sections. So in here, in the map section, you'll see this load up a section of Google Maps, and this is where I am currently. So for people that like to location scout or keep a record of anywhere where they found that they've got a good got a good location that you want to come back to, all you need to do is just take a picture. Um, if you've got GPS built into your camera, it will already be in the raw file. But if you haven't, then let's say I want you to, I happen to know that this one was taken in a place called Chorley, so all I do is I'll type in into the search bar, Chorley, England. And that, that then gives me Chorley. So you can actually use your mouse to move everything around. And if you use the scroll bar on your mouse itself, you can you can scroll in and find the exact position using Google Street View. And it's quite useful, really, because basically you could take as many features as you want and just drop them in from the timeline below. And then that will actually save, if I zoom out, and you'll see the locations of where you've actually taken your pictures. So it's quite useful. It's not it's not something I use a whole lot of. Um, is there anything anybody wants to know more about this one? I don't have any questions, but it's pretty cool. It's nice to know. Uh, speaking of you specifically, Rocio, have you got the A77 with the built-in GPS? I am not sure. Because <laughs> there's there's two version there's two versions. There's one with the GPS and there's one without the GPS. I think it doesn't have it. Okay, so if you had the one with the GPS, it would do this automatically for you. Okay. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? Tar uh, Taria Regina uh, wants to know. If this info goes into the metadata? Yes, it does. Yeah, basically every 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 data change that you make in Lightroom is saved within metadata. And an advantage that you could use for for Lightroom if you want to capture the exact Google coordinates is if you've got a modern smartphone that's got a GPS unit in you can actually take a picture in the location that you're at using 
that and you can copy it across to other other pictures. Have I lost everyone already? <laughs> no, we're here. We're listening. Okay, cool. So <laughs> yeah, um, so say say you're shooting on location and you really like the location and you'll want to remember that exact spot. What you do is you pop out your iPhone or your Android device because that will save a GPS coordinate into a picture. So you then take a picture and we'll say use this one for example that I'm circling right here and then let's say that was taken with your iPhone so what would then happen is that would have a point on the map and all you'd need to do is select all the photos afterwards and you can actually sync the metadata with it so you just press that and it comes up with anything that you want to sync for the for mas metadata and the one that we want is the GPS coordinate and then you just press synchronize and then it adds it to the map so what you end up with is all these little these little uh, pins that show where you've taken pictures so if I go to that one for example if you hover your mouse over it you actually get a preview of the images that you've taken there are we good? Are we? Yes, we're good. This is really nice to know. Thank you. Okay, so that's that's the map section. If everyone's happy with that, I'll move on to the book section. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So next up is the book section. Now, what Lightroom does is it allows you to tie straight straight into book into blurb, and that's currently just collecting information so I'll cancel that one any any processes that's happening within Lightroom happens up in that top left hand corner so if it's doing something if it's been a little bit sluggish then that's the reason why so at, at the moment this is this is signed into into blurb if you want to create a blurb book and all you do to create that is you get the image that you want and you drag it where you want to and you can literally zoom it in and create your book there's there's all sorts of templates that you can use which are on the right hand side so say you wanted to to create a film strip going across the book you could always do that uh, it's not something I use a lot of uh, but it's nice to have it one of the other settings that it's got is PDF. So you can actually create a PDF book. We have a question. Okay. Tario wants to know if the templates only work with Blurb. Uh, currently there are, I think you can, you can download more templates from Adobe, uh, but with it not being something that's really available in the UK, or cheaply in the UK, then it's not something I use. I only I only really use the PDF side of it. But uh, Apple did actually create a, a deal with Blurb specifically on Apple. I mean Adobe. Okay, thank you. So um, yeah, there's not much not much more to go on that one really. Uh, on the on the books itself, you can actually use this drop-down menu to change your your view of the book, and it's got all these different templates that you can use. So, if you're creating photo books for customers, then that's that's an ideal thing, and that's that's available in the PDF side of things as well. Uh, if everyone's happy, I'm, I'll move on because, like I said, this is just a a whirlwind tour of the other features before we jump into the main. We're good, go ahead. Okay, so next up we've got slideshow. And it's a little bit more intensive. So what this does, uh, some people may have seen some videos that I've posted of behind the scenes. They're all done within this. 
uh, it deals with both images and video. So you can you can create a basic video edit. So all you do is you have your film strip along the bottom and you select the images that you want and then on the side you've actually got all your options that you need. So if you want it watermarking then you can pop your watermark on. If you want it to do text overlays then you can. Uh, color wash is basically what your background is. So you can change that, you can change its color. Etc. You can also add a background image if you wanted to. You can also put intros and ending screens as well. So you can have it so that it starts starts with your main screen. At any time you can press the preview button and it will develop it for you. And then should actually show its transitions. Right, so at the moment it's set to 11 seconds. Right, so that, that this will be the preview. And all I do is I'll change it to like 2 point seconds. So something, something I'd use this for is if you're if you're doing a wedding or something like that, what you can actually do is take your morning shots, load it onto your laptop, and select them all and have it project during the evening's event on the wall. Is there any, is there any questions so far on this? I don't think so. Oh, yes. Tario says yes. <laughs> I think she's typing. No problem. She wants to know if you can add transitions. The transitions, um, basically, you've got you've got fade. That's that's pretty much the the only transition that you've got. Um, but you can change the length of the fades. So at the moment, it's at one point one point seven seconds. You can you can manually change how long it is, but it is always a fade on this one. Uh, anything other than that, you you'd need a specific video editing or to do it within Photoshop. You can add audio track to it as well. Did that answer your question? Yes, she said okay. Thanks. Okay, cool. So. That's pretty much the whole of the slideshow, apart from on the left-hand side, you can also export a slideshow as video, which is what I do for when I do my little behind-the-scenes videos. And you can also export a PDF. This is, this is your collections tab, and I'll go through that in a second for you. So, is anyone is anyone confused on the on what you can do with the slideshow? Uh, if not, then I will move on. I think we're good. Okay. So, next up, we've got the print module, and when you first load it, you're presented with a page that looks like this. At the moment, it's set up for my A3 printer, which that that particular size is an A3 piece of paper. So let's say you want to create a a single image. You can actually have that go as large as the paper. On the right hand side, it will automatically uh, zoom to fill and rotate to fit if you tick those options on that side. Layout-wise, you've got control of all your margins. So you can control how much in from the edge it is, from the top, 
from the bottom. You can also have show guides as well. So, um, so it all depends on how much information you want. It's there. Uh, you can choose whether or not your print is watermarked or not. From here, this this would also be where you do your your color color management. This is this is purely for printing. This this side of things is. So we've got we've got that part of the print section. Next up in the print section is picture package. So let's say we've got an A3 sheet of paper like we've got here, and a customer's ordered say an 8 by 10 and some other sizes of the same image. So what you can actually do is you can go on this side you've got different sizes that you can add to the package. And each one's got a drop down menu of classic uh, picture sizes. So probably the most one that everyone's familiar with is the 8 by 10. So we'll add an 8 by 10 to the page. And then obviously there's a lot more space on the page that you can you can fit other pictures in. So to save on your printing, let's say our customer has ordered two by two point five, two point five by three point five, and as you can see, as you add them, your packages, your pages just fill up and you can actually the more you press it, the computer actually chooses the best, most efficient for you to be on the paper with, so that you're not actually just throwing away paper. Has anyone got any questions on that one? I don't think so. I think we're good. Okay. So uh, that's that's the print section. Uh, I do use that one because. Every so often, I like to offer the same same sort of deal for customers. So, um, the advantage with the print section is, at the moment, there's one picture on there. If I wanted to say have exactly the same amount of images, but a different picture, all I'd need to do is just select another picture, and it automatically loads them in. The final one on that one is custom if you want to create your own. So you can actually drag it as and where you want. And you can also have it so that when when it prints out it will give you your your lines to so you know where to cut. So that's pretty much it for the print section. Uh, has anyone got anything? We're good. You can move on. Okay. So next up, we've got the web section, and Lightroom actually allows you to output websites or output web galleries. So all you need to do is go to your film strip, which is at the bottom. We're, we're building a little bit of a a rapport with the film strip. So and you select the ones that you want, and up on the right hand side top right hand side, you've actually got different galleries that you can you can actually output with the different galleries like that. Or you've got HTML galleries. I'd probably avoid using the flash ones. Uh, this LRB portfolio is a plugin that I've purchased that actually allows you to uh, output the entire uh, an entire website rather than just a, a gallery so it is very good um, it does have a built in what they call FTP which means it will automatically upload to your to your web server itself and it's simple as adding on 
what you want. I realize this is uh, quite above, it goes more into 102 sort of level, but if anyone's got any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I think we're good on this too. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the library and this is where we're going to spend some time. So if you've got your notepad and paper. So this is how Lightroom presents itself to you. You've got several panes which look a little bit confusing at first, but all of these panes you can actually minimize to the side. to create more space for you. In the center you've got your thumbnails for your images that you've imported and you can choose whatever size that you want of those. At the bottom you've got your film strip as, as we've already seen this is where this follows you through the site so um, this would be where you make your choices for images etc for the slideshow etc. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get rid of that for the moment and I'm going to get rid of the side on that side. When you mouse over it it automatically comes back on. But you I, see I, have, I have a question sorry. Okay. Um, so since we're new with the Lightroom. Yeah. When we import photos do should we import all of our photos or just certain uh, files that we want to work with? I'm going to go through import all the way through to export so and yes uh, I do all of them. Okay. Um, so yeah the on the left hand side what you've got is you've got your navigator and this shows I have another question sorry. Okay. Tar it's T Tario. She says, can you please tell us more about the Lightroom catalog? The Lightroom catalog. Well, basically, Lightroom stores all of the information. Uh, it's non-destructive. And basically, when you're changing stuff in Lightroom, you, you're just basically changing the, changing the actual metadata for the image itself. Um, nothing, is, nothing is destructive in Lightroom. So th the catalog itself gets stored wherever wherever you want to place it on your hard drive and then everything that you add goes into that catalog and the more the more information you get give to it the more the more you'll actually be able to use your catalog does that cover it or does she want I'm thinking she's okay <laughs> yeah she said okay Okay, so um, on on the left hand side, this is basically one Lightroom catalog, and it's my main one that I use. So on the left hand side, you got your catalog settings underneath the navigator, and then basically says select from all all the photographs that you've got. You can have quick collections. Uh, it's something that I don't use, but it's you can create something that you can a collection that you just randomly throw images into, uh, and then you've got previous import. Who's that guy? <laughs> Which will show your previous what, as the name suggests, your previous pictures that you've imported, so you're not loading the entire catalog each time. Underneath that. You've got your folders section. This is where your your pictures are, are stored to. It's just showing you that. It's not something I I use too often, so I I usually leave that one closed. Underneath that, you've got your collections, and this is where the the more power comes in uh, for your for your Lightroom use. So, say for example, I've got a thing for for skies. I've actually got a little library collection just purely of skies and that's that's where I'd put those into. Uh, this 
all of this data is dealt with in your metadata and I'll go through that shortly. You can also do, you can create your own collections and you can create what's called smart collections which will update automatically to depending on what settings you, you choose within Lightroom. What do you mean by upgrade automatically? Well, what's what would happen is these these ones along the side here, the blue, green, purple, etc. Let's say I choose the the blue. When you when you put images into Lightroom, you've got as many ways as you want to sort them. So, along the bottom, you you can actually star them. You can give it up to five stars. There's uh, one, two, three, four. there's eight colours that you can choose, and you can also flag them as well. So, however, what whatever way suits your way of working on how to how to grade your images, um, Lightroom can actually work around you. So, let's say, for example, out of those those skies, where we get to. Right, so we'll go back in the skies. At the moment, there's no there's no ratings on here. And what we do is we'll whoops, we'll create a smart collection, and we'll call it teaching. So when you're creating a smart collection, you can choose match all or any of the following things. So what we'll do for these particular ones is go, we're going to give a rating that is equal to five stars. Plus, we want it to be if it's blue. So we'll go to, we can choose whatever we want. and choose a hey, label color sorry so label color is in this case blue so you'll see that that's now come in to the library section which is where I, I saved it at the moment it's got none none in there. We've got nothing on screen, so I'll go back to the skies. So let's say I think these three images are amazing and they what they need to go into my my teaching folder. So what I'll do is I'll give them all five stars. That's just using my number keypad on my keyboard. If you look, it's still not updating because we set two parameters for it. So I'm going to give them a blue label now. So I'll come back, come back out of that again. So I've selected all three again. I'm going to use the nine key because the way it works is numbers one, two, three, four, five gives you your stars. Uh, seven, eight, nine give you your first four colors, uh, first three colors. Has everyone got that? I got a little bit flustered then. We got it. Okay. <laughs> Everything <laughs> went silent then. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, because we've given it a five star rating and coloured them blue, they're now automatically showing up in that teaching folder. So that that's what I meant by up, updating automatically. 
So how how you would work that is more specific to you. So, for example, you could have anything that is four stars or anything that is four stars plus a color um, goes into a certain file. So I use it for um, things like separating, separating out my portfolio. So for me, anything that's that's blue and over three stars goes into the blue folder. Um, so Gina wants to know if they're still in the other folder as well. Yes. So I've just gone, just gone from the from the skies one. It it can exist in many locations. So we've got the skies one that's still there because there's they meet the criteria of the teaching folder. They've gone to there as well. And because they actually meet the criteria of my blue folder, they've gone, they're showing up in there too. To turn off off the color, let's say we decide, oh, we don't like the color. You can literally just turn off the blue by pressing the nine key again. And that will actually disable the, the, the color that you've given it. It's the same with the star rating as well. If you press the same number twice, it will actually get rid of it for you, but without right. deleting it. Gina has another question. OK. Um, she wants to know if it's making a whole new copy, um, which takes this disk space, or is it just shared? It's, it's shared at this point. What you can do is you can make what they call a virtual copy. So you go over to the image that you want to make the copy of. So let's say this one, for example. And we will, I think it's control click on, on the Mac or right click on the PC. And then basically all you need to do is go down and it say create virtual copy. And it will actually create two versions of that image so that you can actually protect your other image. But it's not actually adding that much extra to your hard drive because everything in Lightroom is actually non-destructive. You're only referencing the original file until you actually send it across to Photoshop or to export it. Great, thank you. So. Is everyone happy on the on the collections? It doesn't have to be a smart collection. You can you can just create a normal collection as well. Yeah, but I think we're good. Collection oh. set. Okay. Question, <laughs> Tario. Yep. Um, how do we access the images if we stop using Lightroom? Uh, the images are going to be wherever you saved them on your hard drive. But to be honest, once once you're once you've got your head around the Lightroom way, you'll always go to Lightroom first before anywhere else. So this is my question. Okay. Every time we upload pictures, they go straight into Lightroom, or do we have to upload them to Lightroom? You import them. You import them to Lightroom. So basically, the advantage of that is when you're looking at the screen like this, within within your raw file uh, is contained a JPEG preview. So what the library section is showing you is the JPEG preview. So when it comes, let's say you've, you've done a shoot and you've taken loads and loads of images and you want to go through each one you can actually flick through. This is how you would actually sort your images. So you can go through and say, yeah, I like that one. I'll give that one a three star. I like that one. I'll... That's only two stars. Don't like that one. I'll give it one star, three stars, etc." So when you're doing that in the, in the develop module, it's actually loading the raw file. Whereas if you do that in the library module is only loading the JPEG, which means it's a lot quicker to actually go through uh, a load of images 
Um, my record is two and a half thousand in four hours. Well, and that's on the JPEG version. That that this here is all on the JPEG. Okay. That, that's that's contained within within the raw file. So you can literally just go go through it. Um, in fact, if I actually pick some, so I'm I'm literally just going to flick through the images now, and you'll see the quick quickness that it's actually going through. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through and next them on the develop module, which is actually loading in the raw file. Tario has a question. Okay. She says, so in the develop, I mean, in the library we call and the develop we edit? Yes. Sweet. Yes. That, that's, that, that's a nice simple answer on that. But you can do some editing in the library module as well. So um, I'm going around in a in an anti-clockwise motion at the moment. So we've gone, we've gone through the collection section. So I'll close that one down. Now, this below that is where you actually get what you, they call your published services. So on, you can actually set up your Facebook page, and you can get other other plugins that will allow you to update your Google Plus and everything like that. And you literally all you need to do is just take the image that you want and drag it to the folder that you set up within Facebook. I mean I don't I don't know about anyone else that but that that to me makes life so much easier than actually exporting and going through to Facebook. And when, when you're setting it up, you can actually we'll go to edit settings. So this is the settings for, for my Facebook. And I've actually chosen what quality I want to export to Facebook to. I've also chose how big I want the images to go to Facebook. I've chosen my what metadata I want to put in because when you put into say the comments section on your metadata, that will actually automatically load onto the the description for Facebook. So you can put stuff in like your website address and stuff like that. So it's automatic automatically done. So you don't actually have to type it in anymore. You can choose how much your sharpening is. I mean we will go through the export a little later, but you do have complete control over what what you actually put up to Facebook. And it's the same with Flickr and there's 500px and there's a lot of uh, plugins that you can actually download from Adobe that that actually allow you to export to your various social networks from within Lightroom. How are we on that one? I think we're good. Okay. Oh wait, Gina wants to know if it resizes for you. You set it will automatically resize to the whatever you set. So if I go back to my Facebook settings again. So in terms of resizing, I've actually ticked the box that here that says resize to fit the long edge to 960 pixels. 960 is like the magic number for Facebook because beyond that the um, compression really starts to kick in and destroy your images. But you have actually got choice of width and height, long edge, short edge, how many megapixels the image is. So you can actually have that as a setting and once you've set it you can save it and you don't have to worry about it again. Does that answer the question? Um, Gina wants to know, can you also do PNG and not JPEG? I will look for you now. I usually output as JPEG. Um, for, 
for Facebook itself, you only get the option of JPEG. Uh, but you can, if I just uh, go to export. So you do get the options of DNG, TIFF, PSD, and JPEG, and the original file for if you're exporting normally. OK, great. Thank you. OK. So that's, that covers the, the Facebook side of things. And when you, the way it works if you use a page um, is you need to upload two images normally to Facebook to create an album so that you can actually see it uh, if you use pages rather than your main profile. If you use your main profile, you can create the albums from within Lightroom. So all you do is you go to um, create a collection. Takes takes a couple of minutes. So if you're doing it straight straight from Lightroom onto your your home page, then you'd create your album here, give your album description, and that would be your album on Facebook. If you want to do it to one of your pages, you go down to existing non-user album, and then that would be where you choose your album that you want to add to on your page. Has everyone got that one? I think so. It's just a it's just a little distinction. Gina says maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> So I'll, I'll just go through that one again for you. So if you're if you're uploading to your personal page, you can create the album here using the album name. If you've already got an album on your personal page, you choose existing album, and that gives you your albums that you've created on your personal page. If you're creating for your photography page, then you need to have two images uploaded to that photography page any previous so that you can actually see the album within Lightroom. And then you choose what album you want to load to and then give it a name and it will show you on the side and in future all you need to do is just drag to that particular album and it will actually update your your album as soon as you right click and press publish all right Gina got it she says okay, okay. <laughs> so that's that's the left hand pane um, when you've got you've also got your your navigator as well so we'll just go back to that one in a second so I've closed everything down on here this is going to give you your your preview updates. So when you're using, I just got a notification. Then, am I still live? Um, yes, you are. Okay. We're just getting new people in. Right. Okay. I I wondered what what that was. Hello, new people. So, uh, yeah, this is your this is your navigator pane. And what you can do is it will actually give you your zoom settings as well. So you can zoom in. You can also choose how big a size you want to zoom in. You can choose to fit to screen as well. So this is that's just your, your quick your quick settings just on the side there. So Carrying around in the anti-clockwise motion, we'll get rid of that side. So this is where stuff actually starts to happen for you. So we've got the quick develop. Now you can, like I said before, you can actually do some limited editing within the library window. So I've got a save preset on there, which is for compensating for my 50 millimeter lens. 
Uh, but there's some Lightroom ones that's in there as well. So you can actually go in. If you if you like your more your more quick edits. So if I go into say the photography junkie ones. So that that would be where you can apply a preset within that area. That also applies to videos as well. That's that's how you would actually do color edits on on your videos. You also have exposure control, contrast, shadows, blacks, etc. Clarity. So that's that's more sort of for people that are used to your general edits. Um, so if you don't want to spend time actually editing an image, you can you can just go straight to that and not actually worry about the develop section. So is everyone happy on that part? I think we're good. You can also choose your crop ratio as well on on there. So if you wanted it square, for example. Uh, it's not it's not as advanced as the crop section setting on the on the other section, but you know, you can get away with it. So one of the things that Lightroom excels at is its catalog. So in order to have a good catalog, you need to be able to keyword. And I'm terrible for doing this because I I usually want to get on and sort the images out. So, so there's keyword suggestions. And the more you put in, the more, the more accurate your suggestions will get. So you can, for each image, you can actually choose all the keywords that you think apply to the particular image. So for this one, we could go black and white. And you just press enter and it goes in. And all this gets stored in your metadata. So you can have keyword sets as well. You can choose your most used keywords to come up in your keyword set. So if, if there's particular ones that you that you like to go to, just to make it quicker, you can add them in there and they will come up in your keyword set. Has everyone got that? I think so. OK. So you've got your keyword list. There as well. You can also choose then. Go. You can go in. You can add them. And when it comes to comes to searching, you can actually search via keywords. So if if you if you're a big skies fan and you've taken some moody skies, you could type in moody sky, and everything that you've come up with the tags for moody skies would come up as your selections. So when when your catalog starts getting large and if you do a lot of stock photography for yourself, then you can actually use Lightroom to, to find the images that you want to add into your fine art images, for example. Uh, you also get presets for for this before I move on, is everyone happy with the the keyword list. I think so. OK, so we'll move on to the metadata side of things. Now, this is where it can actually get interesting, because you can add as much information to an image as you want. So if you see along the side here, I've actually got, under the caption sec section, which is the bit that actually goes into Facebook and actually fills up the description. I've actually written 
where people can go to click my link sort of thing. And that will automatically get exported into Facebook. I think it's the same with Google Plus as well. Uh, you can create all of the all of your copyright information that goes in there. But what I like to do is actually create a preset for it. So all I've done then is I've gone to the preset section. If I just cancel out that one, I've gone to preset selection, then edit presets. This brings up all the all the data that I want to add. So what I can do is you can change your labels and everything like that. You put on all of your information that you want. And this is all embedded within every single image. And there's huge amounts of information that you can put in there. So I know Facebook strips a lot of it, but some of it's surviving and when you output to your customers and things like that, then the information is still contained within the files. Is there anything that anyone wants me to run over on, on this particular preset? Mm, I don't think so. Gina says, good to know. I didn't know how that worked. Awesome. <laughs> well, the advantage oh. with that, the advantage, the advantage with the preset section is once you've saved your preset, you can actually apply it on import. So we'll go to the import section. So this brings up the import dialog. And this is the point where we're going to we're going to go through and actually go from start to finish. Wait a second. Gina says she has a question. Okay. Um she says, do you enter all this at once and then make a preset? You enter it all one time, save that as a preset. She says, cool. <laughs> so the reason, the reason why you create a preset, it, my, my particular preset is called import because that's the information that I want to, that I want to put in there. Um, so what I will do is I will, when you insert your, when you insert your card, Into into your computer, you will actually get this window come up, which is your import dialog. So I've created a file on, on my computer just to create a, an import thing. So what happens is in the main window, this gives you a preview of what's on the card. So on this particular one, there's a se selection of images and a couple of video files. Because you can you can import video into Lightroom. So, so on the left hand side is where you go, where you get your uh, files from. In this case, it's a file on my computer, but it, usually it would be uh, under. There'll be another option on there that says removable drive, which will be your card, and this should happen automatically. On, on some summit though, it depends on what you've got on your import settings for your computer. So this is our, our fake card and as you can see there's images on it and a couple of video files. Video files are quite big so this, this is all dealing with the preview from your camera. So you can actually go through and say, say taken a bad shot and the flash didn't fire and everything's black there's no point in importing that one so each of these has got a tick box so you just untick that one and it wouldn't import it I think that answers your question a little bit from earlier as well doesn't it Rossio? Yes <laughs> So yeah you, you, this is where you start to do cold process so I only want to import one of the videos. So I've turned off that and I've literally just got that one video. And then I decided that I don't like that image. So that's 
that's the images that I want to import. So on the right hand side, you've got how it imports it. So the preview side of things is your you've got choices of the different sizes. So you've got minimal, which is the least amount of data it can pre have have available to you without without rendering. So I don't tend to use that one. Um, embedded in sidecar generally means that the information is going to be there, but when you click on it and full size it, it will actually have to do its render then. You then got standard, and then you've got full size render. So stand, standard is a large image, and then full size is your full size imaging, but these take a lot more time to actually process. Is that on clear for people? How is it for everyone? Um, I think we're all good. OK. So you've got the option to build smart previews. This is useful for people that, say, use a laptop or something like that. And what that will do is it will create a mini raw file alongside the other one that you can actually edit on the road and output reasonable size images that you don't get the full resolution uh, but when you plug you can actually save your library on say an external hard drive and build your smart previews on this and you can edit your smart previews and then when you plug your drive back in it will actually apply those to to the images It, it came in with Lightroom, Lightroom 5. Um, it does take time to do, and I don't work on a mobile computer, so I've got that un unticked. But it's, it's useful to have the option. Does anybody have any questions on the smart preview side of things? I'm waiting a little bit, but it doesn't what? seem like it. I think we're, we're all right. OK. So, um, Underneath that, you've got the tick box for do not import suspected duplicates. So if you've got something with the same the same file name, you don't want to import it more than once. So you can actually tell Lightroom to ignore it. Um, so for those people that actually do um, a decent backup system, so say you've got two hard drives in your computer and you want to send one to each hard drive, you would have the option for your card to actually send a second copy to another drive, uh, which helps with your backup routine. Um, at the top, you've got the choice of how it gets added. So you can just add it to your catalog you can move it from its location to the location that you specify, or you can copy it. So I'll just go copy for the moment. And that gives me more options on the right hand side. So you can also copy it as a DNG, uh, DNG being the digital negative that Adobe do, which um, increases its its durability in terms of um, Adobe products, but not everyone uses it. It's, it's a good file format, but um, I don't see anyone's raw file going out of date any, any time soon. Does anyone actually use DNGs? Yeah. Uh, I don't think so. Gina? Pario says, what is a DNG? It's uh, Adobe's version of a raw file. Basically, what happens is it takes a raw file and creates a universal format that will work in any Adobe system. So 
let's say you wanted to let's say you're like me and you're too stingy to upgrade from Photoshop CS5 which is what I'm still using uh, if I wanted to actually process a raw file from my camera CS5 doesn't support it so all I'd do is just copy it as a DNG and I'd be able to process the raw file in CS5 without actually having to upgrade. <laughs> Does that answer his question? Does that answer your question, Tario? She says she's confused. Okay. Um, so bas basically, you've got your raw file from your camera, and Adobe in the infinite wisdom, after up until Creative Cloud, if you want, if they stop producing, say, CS5, which they have done, and you bought a new camera, it wouldn't actually read your raw file for your new camera. So what happened was they created the DNG format so that newer raw files can actually be read in older operating systems. Tario says, when I upload a file, it is a point .cr2. Yeah, that would be the Canon raw file format, if I remember rightly. You can actually convert that Canon raw file into a DNG if you wanted to. It's something that you don't have to do, though. There's lots of arguments on the internet between raw or DNG. Um, they're both pretty much the same thing. She says, OK. OK. So uh, does anyone else have any questions about the copy as, or the, the DNG? I guess not. I guess not. OK, so um, we go to the metadata setting. I've got, you've got apply during import. So if you know that everything's going to be black and white, then you can always apply during import a black and white preset. There we are. So at the moment, I've got film sharp because I've been shooting a lot of film recently, and I like to add a little bit of sharpness before I even get to the image. Um, so I'm going to take off that one. But we go to the metadata one, and if people, if you remember, we actually created a, showed you the preset for the for the metadata. So all you have to do is just choose, in my case, the import preset, and that will actually apply to every single image that you import. So you don't have to you don't have to remember what your import is. If you, because I, I always forget personally, um, so it's nice to be able to just set it and forget it. So regardless of what image I'm working on, within that data is my copyright information, stuff like that. Um, and you can create different presets because you can save different keywords as part of your preset. So say, you were doing landscapes, you could do a landscape preset and it will actually put all your landscape tags in. So it helps with your with the cataloging before you even get to the to the screen. Is everyone happy with that? Any questions? I think we're good. Okay. So because we're copying this one, we need to know where to copy it to. So this will actually give you your typical file tree for where you want to save your images to. Uh, in my particular case, I save it to my E drive, and then I just go to general. And then all you do is you press import, and what that does is it clears everything out. It's not actually deleting anything. 
it's just purely dealing with the files that you're importing now. So it takes takes a little while to do. Uh, is there anything anybody wants me to recap over so far before we go? I'm waiting, waiting, waiting. <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> So we just we just imported the files, and that's shown up. We've got one video file in there, which is 34 seconds, and the rest of them are raw files or film files, in my case. So I've mentioned video, and if you remember, you can actually change the size of your thumbnails. So when you're dealing with video, if you actually hover your mouse over the over the preview and move it right to left, you can actually scrub through to see what's in your video file. It's a little feature that I think is actually pretty cool. So We've got we got our images, and so we want to um, let's say pick this one here. So we, now we actually go into the develop module because I, I like to have a lot more control over it. So we've got all of our options. On nice little sliders, so you can change what what you want to do. Now I've left I've left the film strip at the bottom uh, for a specific reason, which I'll go to shortly. So if if you like your tones, like playing with your tone curves and things like that, then that's all there for you. You can change your saturation levels and everything like that. Basically, this is just Adobe Camera Raw, just a little bit on steroids. So everything that you've, you're used to in Photoshop for Adobe Camera Raw, you've got on here as well. So you've got your vignetting controls. But let's say I actually like what I've done there. And I've got several images in the same set that I really like, but I don't want to go through the hassle of changing everything to look the same. So one of the advantages of Lightroom is that you could select multiple from your from your film strip at the bottom, and then just go sync, and that brings up this dialog. And you can actually choose what to sync between the images. So this is all the effects that I've just changed to it. And all you have to do is just press. In fact, what I'll do is I'll change it black and white, just so that it's more more easier to tell. So we'll go sync. Somebody's saying something. Yes, we have a couple questions. Okay. Okay, Emmanuel um, says, does the amount of adjustment you do on a file, the cost for the slowdown, would presets resolve it, this issue? Um, it depends on if you're doing it on mass. If you're if you're syncing it like I'm just about to show you, then it will actually save you a lot of time just applying a preset and then syncing it to all of them. If you if you find that what the way I like to look at it is if you create looks that that you like, then save it as a preset, which I'll show you how to do shortly. Does that answer his question or um, we'll see. Okay. Uh, Leah has a question too. Okay. She asked, how do you import a preset to the library stage to add it to the default presets? 
the um, how do you import it to the library stage? When when you save a preset, it's available in the libraries. The, there's one there's one section for presets, and that's shared between the develop module and the library. Okay, um, Emmanuel is saying. Okay, let's <laughs> let's deal with Leah first. She okay. says, "How do I add a preset to the library?" I will go through that shortly. Thank you. Um, and then back to Emmanuel about the amount of adjustment. He says it mainly happens when I use adjustment brushes, but I understand. But okay, he understands what you're saying. <laughs> okay. So, and then uh, one more, sorry. Okay. Yida, she says, how do you select the multiple pictures? Basically, you. I'll cancel out that one. So, you'd select as per normal. So, you've got the image that we're working on now. All you do is you go down to your film strip. Sometimes it'll be hidden, so it'll look like that. So you just go to the little arrow at the bottom, and then you, with the shift button on your keyboard, hold that down and select however many you want. If you want to select individual ones, then you use the control button on the keyboard, and then you can select individual ones to change. Does that answer a question? Yep. Awesome. So we'll go back to the sync menu. So we've got the black and white mix selected within the sync option, and all of your adjustments are available to sync, including crops and everything else. And all we do is we just press the synchronize button, and it instantly turns those images to the same settings that we've done now. So if anyone shoots shoots weddings, then that will be a huge light bulb for them because they can, let's say you're adjusting a color temperature for a room at, a, at an event, you can actually adjust one image and then apply that to the entire batch. How are we on that one? Does anyone need anything going over on that one? Um, Leah says, can I think it's on the one before we were explaining before. Can you select just the edited pictures? Just the edited pictures. Well, obviously you'll you'll know which ones you've edited previous to that. So let's let's say these are all edited, and we want to give them three stars. So I'll, I'll swap to the next one. Give that one three stars that one three stars, and that one three stars. Take off that one. So on the bottom here, you've actually got filter sec sections. So if you know that the ones that you've edited have got three stars, you can actually go to the filter section and say, just show me the ones with three stars. And it will just clear all the other ones out of the way and so you can just see the ones with the three stars so then you could also select them all and do a bulk edit as you would. Does that answer a question? Yes, thanks. Excellent. And then Gina wants to know we can edit and apply to whatever images we want and take those specific images into a slideshow? Yes. So these these images that we've just done here, for example, they're all still selected. You just go into the slideshow and I'll just reduce the times. And we'll go to preview. So does that does that answer that one? I want I want to 
answer as much as possible for you. She says, awesome, yes. Excellent. So we'll go back into the develop section. And the question before was about presets. So I usually like to close the left-hand side down just purely to give me a little bit more screen real estate. So we go in. And these are my presets. So let's say I'll do nice extreme examples. So let's say we actually like that as a preset. All I'll do is just go to the preset section and we'll call it um, crazy white. And you can choose how much of it is is actually saved from the preset. So all of the all of the stuff that you've changed down there is available in your preset. And I'm going to save it in the user presets. And we can see it there in the user presets section. And answering the question before, going into the library. So it's already there. If you go into the user presets, you'll see crazy white. So that one answers the one before, hopefully. We have another question from Leah. Okay. She wants to know, can you save those pictures into a catalog or do you add a keyword instead? What's the smartest way to be able to get back to those few pictures? If it's, if it's for one person, say for example, you can always go into your library, which is where you do your organizing. You can always create a collection. And we're going to call this one teaching. And so you've got the option to include selected photos. So we will just create the catalog. So if we show on, on the actual navigator side, I've got a new catalog there called teaching and it's just got those images in. How's that? Uh, I think we're good. OK. So we'll go back to the develop module again. The develop module is a lot more processor intensive than the library because you're actually dealing with the raw file itself rather than the actual the, the little JPEG that's inside. So it's just a, a little bit slower when it first loads in. So within, within your actual um, develop module itself, you've got your different options. So I'll just go through them. So you've got your color, black and white. Remember, everything's, everything's not permanent. So if you change it to black and white, you can always change it back to color. You can change the temperature and everything. So when it comes to accurate white balance, you'll see this little dropper here. And what you do with that is you find something that's designed to be a neutral area. And it changes the white balance for you. It's probably going to be easier if I actually choose a different picture that I haven't edited. Because it, it only changes your white balance. So I'll go back into all photographs. And we'll choose this one, for example. So you've got your options to the right-hand side, which is your different white balance settings. But with this dropper, if you find an area which is this would be a reason to carry a grey card. So you could take a single shot of somebody holding a grey card. Just find it, an area that's grey in the image. And it will actually set your white balance properly for the image. So with the ability to sync it as well, all you'd need to do is just make sure your first shot is of a grey card and then you can sync it to all the rest of your pictures, which means you don't have to... We have Hello. a question. Okay. 
Um, Leo wants to know, uh, so neutral doesn't have to be white? Neutral doesn't have to be white. Um, the best the best colour is grey. You you can you can choose white as well. It should. You'll just get different different shades of it because white reflects a lot of the the area around. What this dropper is looking for is medium grey or eighteen percent grey. Does that answer her question? I think so. Okay. I'm <laughs> taking over for a few minutes here. That's it. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> I, I was thinking, oh, for a your voice has changed. <laughs> so, um, like I said, if you like your curves adjustment, then you've got full curves adjustment within the window. I mean, I, I like to give that sort of film look, so I always take off the blacks a little bit. And none of this is permanent. I, I like to keep on saying that one. Down, down here, you've got your hue saturation luminance. So let's say, for example, the blues are a little bit too strong. I can just go in and just pull down the blues a little bit without affecting the rest of the image. Same same with the split toning as well. Um, let's say I wanted to warm up the shadows a little bit. So I'll just go into the shadows and select a little bit of a warmer tone. And it won't affect the highlights, it will just affect the shadows and you can change the, the balance between the two. From there you've then got your, your noise reduction and your sharpening settings and you've got your lens correction as well. So if you've got certain lenses that, that do funky things, you can actually correct for that within the develop module. Is everyone happy so far? I think so. So uh, next up, I'm just going to go in. And people say there's a lot of um, stuff that you can't do with Lightroom. So I'm going to just going to hide the film strip. I'm going to zoom in. So sh straight away, there's a spot there, and nobody likes spots. So up here along along the top, you've got some icons. The circle one with the with a little direction com arrow coming out of it, that's your spot removal. And all you do is just use your mouse wheel, just to pop over it and you just single click it and it will select from somewhere I'll just uh, make that smaller in a second and you just find it find a place that's suitable to to get rid of your spots you've got the choice between clone or heal heal will actually blend it a little bit better sometimes you want to clone it though um, so the same the same tool a lot of people in Photoshop use um, would use the patch tool. So say we don't like this this crease that's going down following a mouth. It's it's distracting. So what you do is you just click and hold it, the same same tool, and you just follow it along, and then you just select. I have a question. Okay. Um, well, Emmanuel has a question. Okay. Uh, is there a way to copy a spot removal? Say you selected a spot. You can. Yes, I've just got to remember what it is now. It's a uh, Control Alt Shift, I think. A lot of the time, it's easier just to just to actually select the new spot and actually create your own. If you find 
if you find that you've actually messed it all up, you don't like what you've done, you can just press the reset button and it will get rid of them all. Okay, I think that answered his question, so. Okay, yeah, you'll, you'll find that in terms of spot correction, it's easier just to go with the mouse, use your, use your scroll wheel to make it bigger or larger, because not every spot's the same, so you just literally just take it away and then find a good sampling place for it. And it works really well. So next up you have red eye for people that insist on using their flash on top of the camera. <laughs> and all you do for that, it actually looks for red eye. So when I forgot to say, when you're when you're done with your, your spots, you just press done. And then that takes away that little pain that you were dealing with. So red eye correction if you need to. You, you do you select the red eye option and you'll get this funky looking cursor so all you do is you literally just go to the center and you draw the eye in and it will actually get rid of any red eye although I don't actually get red eye in my pictures ha. <laughs> me either <laughs> uh, is that because you're a natural light shooter? yes you're right <laughs> that's cheating I know <laughs> <laughs> so is everyone happy so far on those on those two I think so nobody's writing so next up we've got the the graduated filter oh I can hear myself so graduated filter comes up with these these options here and let's say I don't like this, this all this in shadow. So I really need to, to do, to make that brighter. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select exposure and drag from the bottom to the top. And what that's done is that's actually created a graduated filter for me. So anyone that's shot landscapes, I know what a graduated filter is. Um, Basically, it's say it's something that changes from one end to the other. So what I'm going to do is just add exposure down the bottom there, and you'll notice that the top half of it hasn't changed at all. Is anyone happy with that, or do they need me to show another example? I'm getting a question mark. Maybe. Okay. Maybe repeat that one more time. Yeah, no problem. I'll find a more suitable image for it to to go on it. Okay. So I'll go back into my library. Emmanuel, you... did, Emmanuel did just ask, so the midpoint is the stopping point for the line? The It drags to as far as you want. So wherever you drag from, that's where the most the most concentrated of that effect is going to be and then you drag away and that I'll show I'll find a landscape picture because it I find it works better on okay on landscapes. so what I forgot to mention before in the library module is if you're zoomed in like that and you want to go back to the grid view just press escape So I'm just picking a random landscape image. That one will do. Right, so we've got we've got a landscape image there of the beach where I live. And so what I'll do is I'll go we've got the exposure setting on the on the graduated filter. And I'm literally going to start from the top and you'll see three bars. This is how much it's actually, that's the area that it's changing. So I'm going to do it halfway down and you can always move it down or up. So 
is everyone can everyone see those three bars? I think so. Right, so this is this is the point where I'm gonna drop the exposure quite I'm literally going to drop it down four stops, which is a crazy amount, but it's good for good for explaining. So, if you notice, I uh, I dragged from the top down, which most most of the most of the exposure is happening at the top, and nothing's happening beyond that bar. And what you can actually do is you can change how big that bar is. And you can also change the position of it, and you can change the rotation of it. Does that answer Emmanuel's question? I think so. Yeah, he said he understands. Okay. So, so for that particular example, I'd go there. I wouldn't have as much reduction on exposure. But let's say I want another one. So all I'm going to do is just, if you see at the top here, you'll see new. So I'll go new, and let's say I want to brighten up this area. You'll see a pin there from the previous one, and I want to brighten up from the bottom. So I'm going to literally just drag up from the bottom, drag it up to me, and then increase the exposure. Does Emmanuel have a question about that one? <laughs> I don't think so. That's pretty awesome, though. So, let's let's say you've got you can have as many of these as you want, but let's say you decide, oh no, the the one that I've done before, I need to go a little bit darker on it. So, you see you see the pins on the screen. What you need to do is just click on the other pin, and you can actually change. The setting for that. If you okay. decide that if, if you decide that you don't like it, you can just hit the delete key and send it away. Okay, so the other Gina was yep. said so you can change the change starts from where you first click. Yes. Yes. So um, if I do that other one again, I'll send the exposure down right to the bottom, and I will start at the top. Well, let's start here, for example. So, as you can see, as soon as I've clicked, everything's black above that line. And then the amount that you drag it out is how much it fades from one to the other. Does that answer a question? I, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that's pretty cool. Um, I do like to use that one. So, if you remember... On the right-hand side here, we've got the different settings. So, again, with everything else in Lightroom, once once you're done with it, just press done, and that dialog box goes away. But if we stay with the same image, let's say we want to create a vignette. Now, you can actually have a circular, exactly the same as what we've done on the on the graduated one, but we've got a circular graduated filter. So as you can see, everything on the outside of that circle that I've just drawn is dark because it's still retaining the same settings from before. And then you can bring that up just to bring your focus to wherever you want it. Okay, I've got a question. Okay. Uh, the other Gina wants to know how many filters can you use on one image? As many as you want. Okay, that's what I thought. But <laughs> I figured you'd answer that. <laughs> so yeah, you don't you don't have to just do one setting with it either. So let's say we'll, we'll take this vignette for example. Let's say we want everything outside of that center circle to go to black and white. So you just 
drag the saturation down and everything outside of that circle goes to black and white. Now of course the next question is what about everything in, in the circle isn't it? Hmm. So um, if you want it to affect just in the circle all you have to do is just invert the mask. Very cool. Does anyone have any questions about the radio or graduated filter? Nobody's popping up. Okay, so I'm just going to delete that one I just created then. So last of the adjustments is the adjustment brush. So this gives you everything that you're used to already on this side for adjustments. But it allows you to draw 